Would you like to open up, please, with me in your Bibles? James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Thank you. You may be seated. And may I encourage you to take out your bulletin. There's a skeletal outline there that I think will be very helpful to you as we share some thoughts this morning on praying to get results. There's no doubt about it, prayer for many people remains a mystery and a tool of last resort when every other possibility has come to naught. But the Lord Jesus wants prayer instead to be a lifestyle for His people and an ongoing, unending conversation that you carry on with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the day. Our Heavenly Father desires to give us good things, but He waits for us to establish this ongoing conversation with Him. God wants to answer your prayers and my prayers in such a way that the answer to our prayers will encourage our faith in God and our trust in God's precious Word. If God wants to answer our prayers, and if our prayers are going unanswered, then it only comes to reason that somebody does not know how to pray effectively. Therefore, this morning I'd like to continue the message from last week entitled, How to Pray to Get Results. How important is prayer? Well, it was important enough to be one of the distinguishing characteristics of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospels. How important is prayer? It was important enough for the Apostle Paul to exhort the Roman believers, be devoted to prayer. It is important enough that Satan will do everything he can to discourage you and me from devoting ourselves to prayer. Satan tries to get us to buy the deception that my prayers don't really matter to God, or that my prayers won't make a difference, or that I never will be a great praying disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, those are lies from the pit of hell. And if you have listened to those and bought into those deceptions, then you are indeed deceived. There is no child of God who cannot potentially be a great man or woman of prayer and see God do tremendous supernatural things in response to your prayers. How important is prayer? It is so important that Satan wages warfare against your efforts and my efforts to be devoted to prayer. I like the statement of Samuel Chadwick. He made this statement. He said, The one concern that the devil has is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion but he trembles when we do pray. Why does he tremble when we pray? Because as Andrew Murray, that great apostle of prayer, once said, God rules the universe through the prayers of His people. People like you and people just like me. How must I pray to get results? If you and I want to pray to get results, we must understand and apply the four basic and fundamental secrets of effective praying. I shared last week, these four secrets of effective praying are not secrets at all. God has not kept them hidden from His people down through the ages. 
it is simply a fact that those men and women who have become great men and women of prayer understood these secrets of prayer and they applied these secrets of prayer and they saw God do great and mighty things. Let's examine briefly this morning the four secrets of effective praying. The first two by way of review and then we'll pick up our study where we left off last week. The first secret to effective praying, to praying to get results, is this. Approach God with a clean and pure heart. It is amazing to me how many golfers will spend more time getting ready to address the golf ball and take a swipe at it than many of us will spend in preparing ourselves to approach the God of the universe our Heavenly Father. We just want to barge into God's presence and not having taken any stock of what is the status of our relationship with God and the cleansing of our own hearts. The Bible says in James 5.16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. I like what Dr. Oswald Chambers said concerning prayer. He says, the prayer of the feeblest saint on earth who lives in the Spirit and keeps right with God is a terror to Satan. The very power of darkness are paralyzed by prayer. Amen. The second secret to praying for results is simply this. Discern the heart and will of God in the matter of which you are praying. In 1 John 5.14, the Bible says, If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if He hears us, then we have the requests that we have asked from Him. Now, folks, this is a critical secret to effective praying. We don't just shotgun our prayers toward heaven and hope that something hits the mark. That's not praying effectively. The more able you are to discern the heart and mind and will of God concerning an issue and align your prayers with what you know of God's heart, mind, and will, the more confident you can be in your praying that God hears your prayer and will grant your request. We must learn to pray according to God's will. And where does God reveal His will? He reveals His will to us in the pages of the sacred Scriptures. That is where we discover His will. And folks, if you and I do not know the will of God, then perhaps it is in part because we are not the fervent and faithful students of His Word that we ought to be. He has revealed to us not everything we may want to know, but He has certainly revealed everything we must know in order to pray effectively, and He has revealed it in His precious Word. When you and I pray, we can pray with greater confidence and we'll get more results if we will pray according to God's promises, if we will pray according to God's commands, and if we will pray according to God's desires as they have been revealed to us in the Holy Scriptures. If you don't know how to pray, then you can always pray, Thy will be done. It's not the most effective way of praying, but you can pray, Thy will be done. And then the third secret to praying to get results is this. We are to pray with perseverance. In Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus says this, and I want to relate it to you as literally as I possibly can, paying very careful attention to the verb tenses of the words as recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. For those who ask receive, those who seek shall find, and to those who knock the door shall be open. Too often, however, you and I become discouraged in our praying and we become 
disheartened. And we give up tragically before we receive the answer to our prayers. And yet Jesus says, ask and keep on asking. Don't be ashamed to keep on approaching God's throne with the same petition day after day after day after day. Why is it necessary that you and I should ask and keep on asking of God? Seek and keep on seeking an answer. Knock and keep on knocking at His throne room's door in prayer. Why would it be necessary? Why would God want us to have to be persevering in our prayers? It's simple. Just like everything else God requires of us, it is for our benefit and our blessing. If God does anything in the life of His children, it is to bless us. So why should His requirement that we persevere in prayer be any different? There are great blessings for those who are persistent in prayer. For persistence in prayer allows God to deepen our relationship with Him. And folks, when you really think about it, the Christian life is growing in a more intimate, personal love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ every day. That's the heart of the Christian life. So if God can cause you and me to have to persevere in prayer so that He can deepen His relationship with us, it is certainly worth having to wait on the answer to our prayers. I love to refer to the classic example of our spiritual father, Abraham. According to Romans chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, God gave to Abraham a promise. A promise that Abraham would become a father, and through that son of promise, the father of many nations. And yet the Bible says... Abraham considered how old he was and the deadness of his own body as far as childbearing was considered. And he considered the deadness of Sarah's body that she was long beyond any childbearing years. And he scratched his head. And the Bible said not only did God make him wait a few years, God made Abraham wait 25 years before Abraham held in his bosom the son of promise, little Isaac. As those 25 years passed, the Bible said that Abraham grew deeper in his relationship with God and his understanding of God. And Abraham came to the conclusion through those 25 years of persisting in prayer and waiting on God to answer, he came to the conclusion that everything God promises God is able to perform. God never makes promises He cannot keep. And that lesson was absolutely critically important that Abraham learn it prior to receiving the Son of Promise because Abraham would need to apply that lesson time and time and time and time again in the rest of his spiritual pilgrimage upon the earth. Sometimes he faltered in applying the lesson and God would give him a refresher course like he does you and me. But during that 25 years of persevering in prayer, Abraham deepened in his relationship with God. Persistence in prayer forces us also to examine our own hearts as we pray and to examine our motivations for even asking God for the petitions we lift up to His holy throne. James 4, verse 3, says you have not because you ask not, and then you ask, but you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motivation. God knows the motivation of my heart, every petition I lift up to His throne, but He also knows the motivation of your heart. Because you see, God examines the heart. That is critically important to Him. And if I ask for the right thing for the wrong motive, and God grants my request, He is reinforcing the wrong motivation of my own heart. And He's much too good of a heavenly Father, and He's got a plan and a purpose for our lives. He does not want to reinforce negative behavior and poor motivation. So God, as you and I are praying, He is examining our heart, and one of the reasons He will force you to persevere as He withholds the answer to your prayer is because He's wanting to cleanse and purge from our hearts impure motivations. 
I love what I read recently about a pastor's understanding of prayer. And he put it in terms that most people can understand. He said, look, if you're in a boat out in the water and you throw a boat hook toward the shore and it snags and you start pulling on the rope, you are not pulling the shore to your boat. You are pulling your boat to the shore. And he says, when we are persevering in prayer, we are throwing the prayer hook to the throne of God and we are pulling day after day after day after day as we persevere in prayer. The purpose of our persevering is not to pull God's will to our own, but it is in fact to pull our will and our heart's motivations so that they line up more closely with those of God. And sometimes the only way that that can be accomplished is for God to force us to have to pull on the rope day after day after day. And as we get closer to God in a personal relationship, He can purify the motives of our hearts. Another preacher said there's going to be a strange room in heaven that's going to catch us all by surprise. He said when we get to heaven, there's going to be this huge room, and in that room are going to be boxes of various sizes all wrapped as gifts with a great big bow on them, and many of them will have your name on it, and they'll be in that special room. And as you, in surprise, go up and begin examining the boxes, you'll see not only your name, but you'll see on it, gift was never given because earth never requested or earth gave up too soon. Folks, we have not because we ask not, and we also have not because we do not persevere in our praying. Remember, when you have to persevere in prayer, Satan will try to get you to interpret that as God doesn't want to answer. Or God is not going to give you what you petition. That is from the pit of hell. Your heavenly Father wants to give. The rule of the kingdom is all who ask receive. And all who seek shall find. And all who knock it shall be open unto them. That is the rule of the kingdom. And Satan hates it and tries to distort it. And if he cannot distort it, completely try to hide it from God's people. If you must persevere in prayer, it is for a divinely appointed reason, and that reason will always involve your blessing. Don't give up. Persevering in prayer becomes uncomfortable. I know because I have to do it too. I like what D.L. Moody says. He's communicating how persevering prayer honors and pleases our Heavenly Father when he makes this statement. He says, Some people think God does not like to be troubled with our constant coming and asking. But he says the way to trouble God is not to come at all. And then the fourth secret of praying effectively to get results is this. We are to pray with perseverance indeed, but we are to persevere in faith. I like what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Jesus says, And all things you ask for in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Turn with me over to James chapter 1, just a few pages back. I'd like to look briefly, draw your attention to verses 6 through 8. He's talking about praying in faith. He says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. I want to point out a couple of things here. Number one, James is saying when you and I pray, we are to pray in faith. It is perseverance that draws us closer to the throne of God and aligns our motivation and our will to the motivation and will of God. But it is faith in persevering prayer that opens up the hand of God to give us that which we request. Perseverance and faith go together and must not be separated. Also notice, he says, don't 
think that a person who is vacillating in their faith should expect to receive anything from God. Why? God does not want to reinforce negative behavior. So if you're vacillating in belief and unbelief, God is saying, look, if I bless this person, they'll continue in their unbelief and belief. They'll vacillate. What is the best way not to vacillate in unbelief? Pray according to God's promises, His commands, and His desires. In other words, if you're going to pray on Mondays, God, I think this is what you want me to have. And on Tuesdays, I'm not sure this is what I need to be praying for. On Wednesdays, yes, God, I do believe this is what will bring glory and honor to you. On Thursdays, I wonder why God hasn't given me my prayer. Maybe I'm not attuned to His will. You see what this double-mindedness is all about? That's why we must not neglect the second key. Praying according to the will of God anchors your prayer request. And there's no need to vacillate because you have a promise from God, a command of God, or a clearly revealed desire of God, and you can lift that up to the Father. He loves it when we pray His Word. But we must pray perseveringly, and we must pray in faith. Faith is not, well, I wish God would do this. Faith is not, well, I kind of hope He'll get around to doing it. Faith is more than that. Faith is a confident expectation that God will move according to His promise, according to His command, or according to the desires of His heart. There's another way of looking at faith, and I really like this. And if you're going to persevere in faith, you need to understand this. This is out of Hebrews 11. Faith is three things. First of all, faith is a confidence that I can trust God. It's a confidence. I can trust God. Why can I trust God? Because He's trustworthy. It's not that I can trust Him because my faith is so great. No, 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 that's just not it at all. Don't put faith in your faith. Your faith is in God. All you need is a mustard seed of faith and an almighty, omnipotent God in which to put that mustard seed faith, all right? So God wants us to understand faith is a confidence. I can trust God because He is faithful. Faith is secondly a conviction that says I'm a child of God. Apart from faith, it's impossible to please God. Therefore, I am of the conviction I must trust God. If God has allowed this need to come into my life, He's a loving Heavenly Father. He must really want me to trust Him. So He's allowed this need to come into my life. Therefore, I, in conviction of faith, must trust God. And if I don't, I cannot please Him. And then thirdly, faith is a commitment. As a child of God, before the need ever arises, Father, I will trust You. And Father, I am committed, even if You force me to persevere in my praying, I am committed to trusting You, and if I perish, I will perish in faith. So faith is a confidence that I can trust God. It is a conviction I must trust God And it is a commitment. I will trust God. Faith is believing that God wants to move and will move in accordance with His promises, His commands, and His desires. That's how you can persevere and persevere in faith. Do you know, I'm going to make a statement some of you think is absolutely crazy, but it's true. It's been tried time and time and time again, down through the ages. I have seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of others. And it is simply this. Genuine faith actually is strengthened by having to wait on God to answer our prayer. I know that sounds nuts. It seems like if God really wanted to strengthen our faith, He would instantly answer our prayer within 20 minutes. Some of you are saying, no, within 10 minutes he would answer my prayer. See, that's the way men and women think. We're the instant generation. We want instant results. God knows that if faith is genuine, it will simply grow with persevering prayer. Now, how do I see this in the Scriptures? Back in Romans chapter 4, remember the life of Abraham had to wait 25 years for God to answer his prayer. But the Bible says in Romans 4 verse 20, And Abraham, considering his own body as good as dead, did not waver in unbelief. But he believed that what God had promised, God was able to perform. Therefore, he did not waver, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Do you see that? He did not waver or 
falter in his faith, but he grew stronger in his faith, giving glory to God. The longer that man waited, the stronger his faith became. And it was because his faith had gotten to that point that some twelve years or so later after the birth of Isaac, whenever it was that God told Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah, the Bible says as Abraham left his encampment and made his way toward Mount Moriah and was preparing to sacrifice his beloved son, the son of his bosom, that he had come to the conclusion that if God had to raise that boy from the dead, God was able to do it. And therefore, he would be obedient to God no matter how difficult and devastating that command to sacrifice his son might be. Abraham would never have come to the belief that God could raise the dead because he'd never seen it happen before. That was something new to him. It's not new to you and me because we have the biblical record. But he had never seen that happen before. And yet he came to the conclusion God could do it because over that 25 years his faith had been strengthened. I like what Andrew Murray says. He says, When the Lord wants to lead someone to great faith, He leaves their prayers unanswered. God does nothing by chance, nothing without a reason. If He calls upon you to persevere in prayer, do it. Do it if only for the selfish reason of wanting to get the blessing that comes to those who persevere. Do not become discouraged in your praying because God's timing is always perfect and God's plan is being worked out in your life and in the lives of those for whom You are praying. Know that our God hears our prayers and He delights to answer our prayers. Again, Andrew Murray once said, In all of Scripture, this is considered the chief thing in prayer, the assurance that prayer will be heard and answered. Folks, why in the world would God ordain prayer? I've wrestled with that issue. I'll be honest with you. If God is sovereign, if He's omnipotent, why would God ordain something like prayer? Why does He want His saints to get on our faces before Him, lift up our needs to Him in prayer? Folks, it is a mystery of sorts, I must admit. But God has ordained prayer as a means of drawing us into that relationship with Him, of strengthening our faith, and of our discovering the wonderful character of God, His faithfulness, love, mercy, and grace through prayer. And God does rule the world through the prayers of His saints. If God wants to do something in all the earth, then He's going to lay that on somebody's heart, somebody just like you, and cause you to pray for that concern over here so God can move in accordance with His heart over there. You and I, through prayer, are a vital part of the working out of God's plan.